Um, but yeah, I, I think first and foremost, I would really like to thank um, Indiana University Center for Women in Technology for organizing this 2021 summit. Um, might be a little unusual uh, for three uh, trained Egyptologists um, to be a part of this uh, women and technology conference, but uh, hopefully this lecture will um, elucidate uh, the, the reasons why we're here um, by answering the question, um, why or what can technology offer the ancient past? My name is Julia Biani Pugliesi. I am a uh, doctoral student in Egyptology at Harvard University. I was trained as a master's student at Indiana University and um, our former advisor, Dr. Stephen Benson, um, is in uh, this panel with us. I'm joined here by my colleagues, Aaron Anderson and Justine Galambus, who will introduce themselves um, a little later in the panel. So we'll just get started. Um, in short, this talk emerged in part because as women um, who use technology in the humanities, we felt that there were bridges that separate humanities and STEM related fields. Um, bridges that manifest in biases um, listed um, on this, oops, listed on this slide. Um, biases that we might be familiar with as women or as users or femme identifying women um, or as users of technology or as humanistic researchers. But we also felt that when these bridges are crossed um, that it could open and actually open endless interaction and overlap with the exploration and preservation of our past and the advancement of our, of our present scholarship. So by the end of this panel, I hope you will understand these two takeaway points, that the specialization in these technologically dense techniques does not preclude specialization or study in the humanities. And likewise and inversely, that the expertise in the humanities is not exclusive to the utilization of science and technology. So what do we mean when, we, um, when we're referring to the ancient past or the study of the ancient past? The study of the ancient past includes examination of culture, civilization, religion, and language, all of the cool things that make up human experience and practice from the earliest records of human history to the post-classical period. So around 5000 BCE before the common era to 1500 um, CE within the common era. So traditionally, this exploration of the past has branched specifically in the mid 20th century into fields such as archaeology, art history, sociology, anthropology. Um, but over the course of this panel, we'll be focusing on the top three, archaeology, art history, and philology, and how technology can better um, research within these sub-disciplines. I'll now hand over to our first panel speaker, Erin Anderson, who will talk to us about photogrammetry. Thank you, Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. Like Julia said, my name is Erin Anderson, and I am currently a master's student studying Egyptology here at Indiana University. And today I'm going to be talking about some different techniques that can be applied to material culture and archaeology, uh, specifically photogrammetry, as you see here. And then I'm going to talk about a case study that I have been working on. So, fabulous. Um, so I'm going to start off, always does that. <laughs> Come on. Ah, sorry. There. I'm going to start off um, explaining what photogrammetry is and some of its benefits. So photogrammetry, if I can get it to stay on the slide that I need it to stay on, um, is basically the process where you stitch together multiple photos um, so that you can see an object um, and have a 3D model of an object or even a site. And the idea is to take the photos 
as close to 360 as possible to create a model on my computer um, that I can then manipulate and work with. So you can see um, the right hand image of this slide is all the camera positions that would be taken um, in order to create this particular model. So there are a lot of benefits to photogrammetry. Um, I'm only going to hit on a couple of these. So the main benefits for me and my work are that photogrammetry presents a model that is shareable and portable. So with a 3D model, I can easily just upload the files to a thumb drive or perhaps the internet, and I'll have easy access to them regardless of the size of the object or the site or wherever I am. So for example, I could take, a, I can make a model of a really large temple and then I can sit here in my office at home and I can study it and I can zoom into the tops of the pillars. Um, and obviously that's just not possible without the model. I would not be able to do that otherwise. Um, the other primary benefit for me is their mutability. So with a digital file, I can work on an entire site or a large object. And if I want to come up with alternative versions for what I think a restoration would potentially be, all I have to do is hit save as. And this is really important for conservation because sometimes we don't know all of the variables or we might have some conflicting data. And so we have some conflicting ideas about what a good proper restoration might look like. So it's important to have a couple of different options for that. And the last thing I'm going to touch on is photogrammetry is relatively inexpensive. Um, so you can see here I have a photogrammetry toolkit. Um, this is just kind of the various things that you might need if you're looking into doing photogrammetry yourself. And you'll notice that there's a pretty good range for some of these costs. And that's because it depends on what you want to do photogrammetry for. If you're wanting to just kind of play with this as a hobby and you can have a lower quality model, you can kind of get away with using your phone, the camera on your phone and some of these um, other software systems. But if you're needing a very high quality model for in-depth scientific analysis, then you are definitely going to probably need to spring for the high end DSLR camera. And the same goes for your computer. The larger and more accurate your model needs to be, the fancier computer you're going to need. And then the software is generally the other main cost when starting off with photogrammetry. And again, there are some low cost options out there, but they generally will have like data limits and they can produce lower quality models. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind when dealing with software, especially, is if you are a student or affiliated with an institution of some sort, you can generally find um, student discounts on licenses or even through the institution. So, for example, IU provides the entire Adobe suite um, to anyone affiliated with it. The IU supercomputer has licenses to Metashape. Um, that with just a little bit of networking you can have access to. So then you wouldn't even need to pay the $60 for that student license for Metashape. So there are some options out there. So now I'm going to move on to a case study that I have been working on that kind of demonstrates some different techniques that can be applied. So this is a kippus here in the Eskenazi Museum of Art on the IU campus. Um, and you'll notice it's made of this material called steatite. It's that shiny black material. Um, and this is going to be important here momentarily is why I bring this up. You'll also notice that it is very beat up. So it's got scratches, whole chunks have been carved out of it. And it has that lovely price sticker on the back of it because until recently they did not think it was authentic and it was being sold as home decor. So normally when we are trying to look at these types of objects, we would read the, the inscription that's on the back to help identify when and where this was created. But obviously for various reasons that is not possible on this particular object. And so that's where technology is coming in to give me a hand. So the first thing that I did with this object is I performed photogrammetry on it. Why did you jump? Um, so I took the pictures in 360 degrees, as you can see here, and actually the image on the right is where I have taken off the material. I have stripped it off so that we are just seeing the surface geometry of the object itself, um, because that black material is shiny and can be obnoxious to work with. It makes it very difficult to see the inscription. And with technology, I can simply take that off. 
So the next step that I, I did is I performed what is called virtual reflectance transformation imaging or virtual RTI, where I used that model without the material on it. And I took a series of photos where the camera stays in the same position, but the light source gets moved around. And the software will composite this into a single file for me where I can then play with the light source. So you can see I've got a couple of pairs of photos here. And on the top, I have moved the light source. This little green sphere is where I control the light source. And on the top images, I have hit the object with raking light or light coming from the far side. Um, and on the bottom photos, it's being hit with more direct light and different features become more apparent by playing with the light source. Generally for me, for seeing inscriptions, raking light is really beneficial. It creates that contrast. And so I can do that without that shiny material on, on it from my home. I also performed manual RTI where I actually just took the object itself and took a series of photos with the changing light source around. And again, you can see that far left image has direct light, the bottom right image has raking light, and you see how the inscription changes. But as you can see in that bottom right image, that steatite, that black material is very shiny and creates additional reflection, which is why it was really useful for me to strip that material off of it. Um, so this is an RTI toolkit, very similar to the photogrammetry toolkit that I put together. Um, RTI is generally a little bit cheaper than photogrammetry. Um, in this case, you do need the camera to remain absolutely still throughout the entire process. And so it might be possible to mount your phone and use it as a camera. Um, but using a DSLR camera with a tripod is going to yield much better results. And once again, the quality of your computer can really affect how well this turns out. Um, the software for RTI is generally much cheaper. There's a couple of different builder and viewer options out there, but the most popular and the one that I'm familiar with is the RTI Builder and RTI Viewer offered by Cultural Heritage Imaging. They provide um, software and, and instruments and materials for all sorts of cultural heritage imaging, obviously. Um, and their software is free with a $50 recommended donation. Um, they also provide an RTI toolkit, which is mentioned further up in the list, which includes some other really essential materials, including a black reflective ball and a mount, which is essential for the method of RTI. So the last thing I did for this kit this is I performed, performed digital epigraphy, which is really just a fancy way of saying I traced the photos and the inscriptions with various set conventions. Um, in this case, I used Photoshop, um, but Adobe Illustrator is the other really popular method. And using these line drawings, I could kind of composite the inscriptions together. So I traced them in black, whatever I could see. And then I referenced my RTI and my virtual RTI and I added to them in red where previously the lines were unclear or I couldn't see them at all, but the RTI made it more apparent. And I added to them in red just to kind of keep track of everything. So digital epigraphy is the cheapest of all of these. Um, Photoshop and Illustrator can rack up a little bit of a cost, but again, through IU um, affiliates do have free access to the Adobe Creative Cloud. So to kind of wrap up my little portion, what can digital imaging actually offer historians and archaeologists? So a lot. First and foremost, it helps so much with digital preservation and documenting our past. Um, so like we say in our abstract, the past isn't getting younger. And these objects can decay over time and worse, the older they get. So having a digital model, some sort of digital record of the object is gonna help future historians and archeologists. Secondly, it can provide new insights, such as me finding more of the inscription on that kippus with the RTI and the VRTI than I could just with my naked eye. But one thing that we do need to keep in mind is the end goal of any given project and knowing which process is going to be more beneficial for us. So for example, if my goal is to restore the paint that I believe to, be, to have been on a statue, I obviously should not go perform RTI on it. That's not going to be of much benefit for me if that is my end goal. So knowing these different processes and knowing which ones are best for certain situations is essential. 
And the last caveat I will leave you with is that these processes do require a fairly substantial computer that can handle large amounts of data. Um, and it can have a considerable price tag starting off for the computer and the software um, just starting out. So with that, I'm going to actually hand you back to Julia. Aaron, thank you so much. Um, so we're, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and I want to take this interlude to share with you a methodology that requires some expertise in programming languages um, in order to analyze and investigate dead languages, languages that are no longer spoken, um, a language like our infamous uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic script, which maybe draws many of us to this panel today, um, so that we can understand how it functions and what secrets uh, it may be uh, hiding or keeping from us. This methodology is known as computational linguistics, which in a very few words means the investigation of how written or spoken languages work through computa computational methods and tools such as machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, two very sexy words being thrown around these days, or a more manual approach or an approach that I prefer um, called pattern matching um, that uses regular expressions. And these have produced solutions, um, uh, solutions that have been integrated um, within our own interfaces like OCR, optical character recognition, which allows us to search for um, text or, or words or keywords in our PDFs, for instance, to a more complex tool known as natural language processing. And interestingly enough, computational linguistics has been used by Egyptologists um, since the 1990s. So from a, ver a range uh, for a range of purposes, extending to coding or um, the use and creation of Unicode, which we have just an example here, a very um, um, used software known as JSESH to textual databases, the storage and digitization of, um, of our ancient Egyptian uh, textual corpus um, shown here with the Thesaurus Linguae Aegyptiae to um, a more recent experimental project brought about with uh, the one of the more recent Assassin's Creed's uh, games, uh, Assassin's Creed's Origins, uh, this was a project that wanted to test whether machine learning could help automatically identify hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt with semi-success, depending on who you, answer, uh, who you ask. So what I thought I would do is show you kind of the midway and yet another way in which um, computational linguistics, the use of programming languages can help us identify rhetorical phenomena, um, patterns, um, unique features of the Egyptian language um, through computational linguistics. And through this case study is um, my master's thesis from IU, where I looked at a very interesting manuscript um, shown here, a papyrus uh, dating to a, a very interesting period known as the New Kingdom. And it is written in the calligraphic form, the cursive form of our monumental hieroglyphic script. And this is called hieratic. So here you see this script on papyrus. So Julia is currently in a remote part of Vermont woods and does have some internet issues. And what this script on this particular manual Yeah, she might be having a connection problem. I'm Hi, can you hear me? Hello? 
I think we got you back. Yeah. I think we uh, your video is off, but maybe Hi. we just Hello. off. Oh, great. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah. No. Maybe, Julia, I don't know if you can turn your video off or if you already have. Well, improves that. Okay. Um, maybe another thing is if you go to, if you go to like more next to share screen, um, you can disable your own video receiving. Maybe that'll also help. I don't know if you found that. I don't know. She might have just dropped all together. Yeah, we might have dropped her. Yeah. Let's see. Do you have it easily or do you need me to get it pulled up real fast here? No, I'm I'm pulling it up. We'll just start okay. from <laughs> where I am. Hopefully she's able to join us back up here soon. Um application window. Okay. Um, okay, so you guys can see that, yes? Very good. It still looks good. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we'll get back to Julia as soon as we can. But um, to introduce myself, as Julia had mentioned, my name is Justine Columbus. I am a current second year medical student at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, and so today in this portion of the panel, I'll begin by discussing the intersectionality of art and science by covering select lab techniques used in art conservation. And then I'll finish the section briefly by covering the use of vertopsies on mummified human remains. So something that I struggled with when I was uh, going through my undergraduate studies here at IU is that I never really saw a crossover between what I was studying and the humanities. I always thought that they were very secular from each other. And it was only once I started my Egyptology coursework that I realized how involved scientific methodologies are in modern art conservation. And nowadays, art, conserv art conservators are both historians uh, and scientists, and they examine and study artwork as well as restore and prophylactically protect those pieces. Um, as an example, uh, UCLA's art conservation program, which works with the Getty Art Museum, requires undergraduate scientific prerequisites and then integrates that scientific study throughout their curriculum. So as we can see, increasingly, art conservation has a greater demand for scientific training. Of particular interest to art conservators is the application of non-destructive analysis and reversible restoration. Uh, this analysis and restoration are both based on the materials in provenance, which is where the item was originally produced, um, of that piece. So to get started, uh, I wanna clarify some important terms. Spectroscopy is the study of radiation and matter, um, whereas spectrometry is that experimental measurement. Though these terms are technically different, they are often used interchangeably. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> and so while spectrometry is a very general term, spectrophotometry is the measurement of intensity, specifically as a function of wavelengths or imagery, or <laughs> energy. energy. And then lastly, colorimetry is the measurement of color. So before we get started in on spectrometry, we should first consider how we actually perceive color. Now, color is determined by the energy of the light that is reflected by an object, 
Ideally, an object is irradiated with white light, which contains the entire visible spectrum at an equal intensity. Uh, taking the spy on hippo as an example, when the light hits the hippo, blue light is reflected into Liz Taylor's eyes, whereas all of the other colors are absorbed by the object. So in the study of art, we are often looking to analyze composition, be that of stone or paint or any other material. Composition can better inform authenticity, provenance, and conservation methods. Here, we have an overview of various spectrometry techniques used for composition, compositional analysis. Um, different techniques utilize different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and primarily we'll be utilizing infrared to X-ray radiation, and the techniques can be destructive which would require a sample to physically be removed or destroyed in the process of analysis, or they can be non-destructive, which would not require that removal or destruction. Um, today, we will specifically be talking about X-ray fluorescence and then uh, fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy. So X-ray fluorescence is used for elemental analysis. Uh, this can effectively create a fingerprint for the substance, and it works by utilizing an X-ray beam that then expels core electrons in an atom. And then as the atom then relaxes down and all of the electrons go to fill in that gap, a specific amount or a quantum of energy is released in relation to that relaxation. And then that energy will correlate to different elements. And so, this creates an effective elemental fingerprint to the object or substance that you're analyzing. And while this technique is very sensitive and non-invasive, it does tend to be very expensive with equipment ranging anywhere from 30 to $75,000. Um, on the slide, you can even see an example of an XRF spectrum and you can see the different elements um, as well as their recorded intensity. So next we'll talk about our fiber optics reflectance spectrometry, so abbreviated FORS. And this is a measurement of actual color, which is significant for the study of art and cultural heritage. The technique isn't typically used for compositional analysis or structural analysis, but it can be used for identification if you have known reference spectra, and then you compare them to unknown samples. Um, one of the best things about this is that this is a non-invasive technique. It's by far the most cost effective out of everything on that initial summary slide. And then the equipment itself can fit inside of a lunchbox. You know, you still need a power source as you would with all of those other techniques. But whereas some of those methodologies have equipment that's, you know, the size of a coffee table or bigger, this really can be packed up and taken on site as long as you have a nearby power source. So we're going to take a look at some forest spectra soon, but before we cover those, this is an overview, um, or I'm gonna give an overview of some common pigments that the Egyptians used. They obviously had a very uh, colorful culture with extensive polychromy covering their statuary and architecture, as you can see here in this beautiful uh, tomb relief. So these are just a few examples of pigments and their associated colors that the Egyptians used throughout their extensive history. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but it does give you an idea that they really did cover all colors in the rainbow. So I'd like to play a bit of a game with you guys if you'll allow it. Here we have a four spectra, which includes the visual spectrum on the left uh, portion of the x-axis, as well as the reflectance on the y portion. Um, so the reflectance, if we remember, is what we actually see. And the higher the reflectance, the more light is bouncing off of that object. Whereas low reflectance means that there's increased absorbance, and that is what we don't see. And what we can typically do is take the peak of reflectance, and that will generally give us the color but we can also look at the trough in reflectance or the most absorbed color. And the opposite of that also will usually give us the color of what we're analyzing. So even though you guys probably won't be able to get the actual pigment here, uh, I'd like to play a game where we can guess at least what color this spectrum is producing. 
So I'll walk you guys through this first one, but I'll have you go on your own for the second. So in this first spectrum, we can see that there's a peak right around the mid blue range. And so what we should be thinking, oh no, uh, what we should be thinking is that the spectrum is most likely going to be uh, the blue pigment. And then if we look at what is most absorbed or least reflected, we can actually see that there's a peak right around the yellow orange range. And the opposite of this again would be um, blue. And so as we can imagine, uh, the spectrum is of a blue pigment. It is of Egyptian blue, uh, which is a very classic Egyptian pigment. And that is actually what makes that brilliant blue Fiance Hippo that we saw earlier. So now I'll give you guys a few seconds to think through this one. Um, so just as a reminder, think of kind of two points that we'll be looking at, what is most absorbed and what is most reflected. Alrighty. So if we look at what is most absorbed, we actually don't get a lot, or we do get a lot here, but if we look at what's most reflected, we're getting really anywhere from green to red. And so uh, the green and the red should cancel each other out and that would give us kind of a yellow orange pigment. But what's really going to help us here is actually what's most absorbed. And we can see that there's a trough here right around the purple area. So that suggests that this pigment would be the opposite of purple, which is yellow. And sure enough, this is a spectrum of orpiment, which was so named from the Latin orum, meaning gold, and pigmentum, meaning pigment. And so, uh, as you can imagine, this is a brilliant uh, yellow to yellow orange pigment. So what I'd like to do is um, discuss how everything we've talked about thus far can be integrated with some of the other methods uh, given by our previous presenters. So part of my master's thesis was doing a fours analysis of an Egyptian ibis mummy. And through the creation of a 3D model using photogrammetry, specific points of analysis can then be embedded with their, with their respective spectra. And this confers an obvious advantage over having 2D drawn sketches with annotations and a stack of printed spectra. And then the spectrographic analysis that you've done can then be used to better inform a restoration. So uh, we'll finish off with a brief talk of vertopsies. Now vertopsy is a portmanteau of virtual and autopsy. And this is being used uh, typically on the recently deceased, but uh, more and more museums are using it on mummified remains from excavations. Now there are several advantages to this approach, namely being respect for the dead, Though the dead have been removed from their, oh my goodness, I do not know what that was. Though the dead have been removed from their respective resting places, um, they, uh, <laughs> um, these techniques can be used to prevent unnecessary destruction or invasive dissection of those mummies. Um, and then more, oh my goodness. Moreover, these techniques can then be used to create 3D models, which allow for all of the advantages that Aaron discussed earlier. Um, and it includes both the relevant anatomy and pathology. And then lastly, this is also a much more readily accessible uh, technique for long distance analysis versus an actual dissection or an autopsy. Uh, you still need someone physically there to scan the body, but the pathologist can be anywhere in the world. So a vertopsy of someone who's recently deceased from an unknown cause makes sense, but why would we even bother doing this on a mummy from 5,000 years ago? For one, understanding death in antiquity can give insight into the development of disease over time, as well as the culture and living conditions. Utilizing vertopsies to create 3D models allows for better pre preservation and less handling of the body. Um, since the scans can be manipulated more easily, it means that you don't actually have to physically move these delicate human remains. And again, the past isn't getting any younger. So this really allows for the portability and mutability of those, of those remains. 
So, and then what you can also do in the instance that if a tissue does look suspicious on the vertopsy, you can then do a guided biopsy instead of an invasive explorational autopsy. And that way you are again, preserving the uh, rights of that, of the deceased, and you are minimizing the impact on the remains. So uh, one last cool thing about this is that as we get more scan information, we can then use AIs to analyze imaging data and aid in diagnosis. And this is actually already being done in the living people or in living um, in clinical scans where we're actually using AIs to try and diagnose um, pulmonary or cardiac pathology based on uh, ultrasound or x-ray uh, images. So in medicine, we have two main comprehensive imaging modalities that we use for diagnosis, um, and those are CT and MRI. Now, CT scans utilize x-rays to create a serial cross-section uh, that can then be composited into a 3D model. Um, and then for those who might be familiar, MRIs are NMR um, for humans, and that basically uses a really strong magnet to polarize water molecules, and then when those depolarize and, and flip back to their normal state. Uh, that's how you get the scan. And so um, MRIs, as you can imagine, are not particularly useful for mummies as mummies tend to be very dry. Moreover, if there is anything that is magnetic inside of the wrappings or inside of the mummy, it cannot go into the MRI machine or else it will shred the mummy and it will shred the machine. So for those reasons, CTs tend to be the method of choice for mummies. Now, this is just an example of uh, a mummy that the British Museum uh, carried out a vertopsy on. And this mummy in particular dates from 3400 BCE. And they use the scan to then generate a 3D model of the mummy. And here you can actually see that they've stripped it down to just the skeletal layer. A couple more examples of vertopsies are shown here on mummy skulls. And uh, on the left, you can actually see examples of the fractured cribriform plate and the empty cranial vault uh, from the mummification process where they remove the brain matter through the nose. And then on the right, the cribriform plate is actually notably intact and you can even see the shriveled up brain resting in the back. So current challenges to the field are that the field is very niche. Um, it really requires uh, a lot of interdisciplinary training just because even scans from the recently deceased to the living vary so much diagnostically that scans from a dried mummy that's 3,000 years old or, or more uh, is a completely different beast. And so, uh, again, this requires just very specialized interdisciplinary training to become diagnostically proficient in reading scans from mummified remains. Additionally, the equipment is, I mean, prohibitively expensive. Uh, you would almost absolutely need affiliation with a hospital or a zoo in order to get access to a CT machine. And so I don't know if Julia has joined us again. I'm she back. Can... Thank you so You're much. Back. I, I apologize to the attendees and obviously my colleagues um, for that um, weird break in my internet, but I guess this is one of the, the fruits of our remote uh, remote time these days. So I don't have co-hosting um, privileges, but if you want, Justine, maybe you can be my navigator and go back. Yeah, we will take it back. So as my very generous colleague um, goes back a little bit, I hope he can maybe remember for a moment language and the computational advantages to studying languages um, through manual, manual based approaches such as pattern matching. So I think around the time when I when I cut out I was talking about this very special manuscript, um, which is for you dreamers out there, a, a manual for the interpretation of ancient Egyptian dreams. And as you notice, it's not written in a script that we might immediately be able to, to see, but it is Egyptian and it's a cursive um, iteration of our infamous hieroglyphs. 
So what I wanted to do, especially with this manuscript, is to see whether computational linguistics can help us identify um, rhetorical phenomena or patterns within this text. Um, these rhetorical phenomena for me are wordplay or the punning that happens between two or more words, which within the interpretation of Egyptian dreams was an extremely um, popular way of connecting what you've dreamed with what that dream actually means in real life. Thank you. Next slide. So the way that I did this is by treating the text, this um, physical papyrus ancient text as data. So I transliterated or translated what was on the papyrus into a computer readable text. Pretty straightforward. It's what we would have done with OCR as well. And then I generated or created algorithms that would be able to identify specific patterns within that text. And the results were really exciting. Um, next slide, please. So what is pattern matching? This approach um, that, that led me to these very interesting results. Pattern matching is when you take a text and search for presence, for the presence of patterns within that text um, with, uh, with predefined equations. What this does is it helps you search through large batches of texts. So if you're a cozied up Egyptologist at home and you have about 500 texts to look through, pattern matching enables you to look through those texts and identify um, key terms or even key sentences that you're looking for very quickly. Um, next slide. So then if we can scratch our heads back a few slides, even more so uh, now that uh, Justine has spoken, there was that very interesting project um, that attempted to use machine learning um, to identify hieroglyphic texts and learn more about the language through machine learning. Um, and this was done through a crowdsourced um, project. But why then pattern matching? Why didn't I go for machine learning? Next slide, please. Unfortunately, machine learning, while it seems very exciting just to let the machine do all the work for you, what it requires is a high, high volumes of clean data, which unfortunately for us Egyptologists does not exist. Um, we do have a high volume of, of data, but not high enough and not clean enough um, um, for machine learning. This also in turn requires a considerable amount of specialized knowledge, but not enough to address the so-called black box dilemma, which in this really cute um, uh, cartoon, I think uh, uh, best clarifies this, this crisis where you don't have control over what the computer um, is looking for, that it just spits out um, something random on the other side and you're expected just to take that as an answer. I didn't like that. So I went for a more manual based approach and the consequences were really um, incredible. Um, next slide, please. So out of this, and here you see a range of, um, of, of wordplay returns from this text, which has been organized in a series of columns. Um, don't worry about those. But what this um, approach enabled me to do was to identify new word types, new word play types in this text that were not, were not um, previously known. And secondly, next slide, please. Out of these returns, I was able to typologize um, my data much more easily. So I was able to, instead of just calling it a word play, I was able to classify what kind of word play um, I, could, I, could, I could, uh, could see within the text, which hasn't been done in, in the field of Egyptology beforehand. So in short, and I think we can even jump all the way to the end of our presentation, just to some conclusions, we've talked a little bit about digital imaging methods um, as it pertains to material culture, as it pertains to human bodies, um, even as it pertains to um, textual corpora, to the things, um, uh, to what we might read from the ancient past. So what then can we glean from these case studies? Well, 
it's clear that these new these these technologies provide new modalities for preservation, the preservation of our past, documentation of our past, interpretation and analysis of our past, that we can see the past with new and different eyes. And the hope really is to finally bridge this century long divide between sciences, between the sciences and the humanities. And inversely, and maybe this is something that we can talk about in our discussion, I think we have about uh, 15 or so minutes, we can even go over, um, is that the application of technology on the past really does reflect how we use technology in the present. So how um, how these applications benefit or maybe not even work for investigations on ancient lives, for instance, can be improved, um, that the biases that we go into might be removed um, so that our technology and our methodologies can improve um, with the present. So with that in mind, I think we could stop share and maybe even break out so we can see all of our friendly faces um, to just, just take a moment and maybe within our own disciplines, um, just talk about uh, some of the things. If you have any questions uh, or anything, feel free. But thank you so much for listening. That was a really great discussion, a really interesting presentation. I dropped the evaluation link in the chat, so it would be really helpful for our presenters and for the center if you would fill that out. Yeah, this is just um, Q&A at this point. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, I'm happy to hear, we're all happy to hear any questions you might have. Um, we have some uh, discussion points that we can, can draw from, but I'm happy to hear what your thoughts are. Um, I just wanted to say hi. Thank you so much, you guys, for giving this presentation. I'm actually an architectural historian, so mm -hmm. I kind of work in a different field, but like with very similar technology. So um, I'm interested to get your your ideas on how would you preserve and, and not necessarily store, but like what types of resources are out there for preserving intangible heritage, like stories and languages and things like that. I, I know that that might not be your field right now, but like I, if you have any resources or suggestions on like where that field is going, that would be really awesome to hear about. Um, so um, as, as ancient historians, obviously we're always looking for things that have been documented or at least to make the effort or initiative to document those intangible pieces of, of evidence. Um, I'm uh, a part of a, uh, a project called the Giza Project, which is, um, an uh, archival uh, database, but it it's also extends well into uh, the digitization of the monuments and sites um, on the Giza Plateau in Egypt, where the three pyramids um, of, of, of the great wonders of, of the ancient world are located. And what this project aimed to do was, um, this was just an example of, of at least what we as ancient historians have tried to do is to compile all the metadata, all the media that came out of early explorations to the major explorations of the 20th century um, and to centralize that information. Um, unfortunately, we as, um, as ancient historians have an issue with publishing quickly and effectively. Um, so what this project really aims to do is to resolve um, at least a major gap in our sort of, uh, of I guess our historiography um, when it comes to studying the past, because a lot of the a lot of the uh, the, the archival work that went in it has been lost, um, unfortunately, in many ways because uh, uh, storages might flood or maybe there's an earthquake or a fire. Data, physical data is lost. So there's something um, again. This might not answer your question, but keeping in mind that when we're talking about the digitization of our past, we're talking about two very different things. The first thing is the preservation of the original object, the preservation even within intangible heritage, the recording and securing of, of maybe anecdotal evidence, um, at least within um, sort of an audio recording to a, a page versus the digitization of that intangible or tangible heritage in a way that stands the test of time because as we know for a fact 10 years ago 
some of our, uh, some of our technology is no longer uh, compatible nowadays. So we're having to fight um, against, you know, the inevitable decay of our past as well as the inevitable decay of our own technology. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just one example, at least the Giza project is an example. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of other, at least um, like um, I think eth ethnography, um, ethnological um, projects are, I think are maybe a good start. Um, but I wonder if Justine and Aaron or really anybody else in the crowd would like to add on to this. Alas, I have nothing much to contribute on that topic, but. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for chatting about it. And the only reason I asked is because part of my historic preservation work is recording people's stories. You know, I, I do buildings and people lived in buildings for hundreds of years. So to me, it's, it all goes hand in hand. So I think what you y'all are doing is wonderful. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's something that I, I think uh, well, it's coming about at least in my own dissertation work where I'm, I'm working on a cemetery, um, an ancient Egyptian cemetery um, that dates way back uh, be before people actually, be you know, before it was um, abandoned and then reused by some of the local villagers or travelers. Um, so some, you have to do some digging that there are plenty of travelogues and diaries out there that record um, maybe events or encounters or instances that are really unknown, um, at least to Egypt traditional Egyptological approaches that um, we're now seeing at least on my end, and this is I think maybe a discussion, is that maybe in our respective disciplines, we're seeing a break of what was once considered to be traditional ways of doing things, that we as a generation of younger um, scholars are trying to, are realizing that when we're working on a problem, we have to dip our toes in multimedia and multidisciplinary and trans uh, technological approaches. Um, and I am curious to hear about uh, maybe some, some of Rachel, your approaches, um, how you feel like you had to break um, some of your traditional conventions to try and accommodate things that you would normally include in maybe a historical, a sort of an architectural historical analysis. Sure. I, I don't want to talk over anybody else. Does that, I, can you see if anybody else has questions first? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, well, if I can just jump in there too. I mean, it, it made me think that in Egyptology specifically, um, it used to be the case that many Egyptians really like lived close by and among the ancient monuments. And, and in many cases, especially in the villages on Western Thebes, there were people who had, who were, you know, descended from families that had lived there for a couple hundred years and had been closely involved in the original excavations there in the early 20th century. Others had been involved in clandestine excavations and, um, you know, there were houses, for example, that were built on top of tombs and people would excavate in their basements and sell things on the antiquities market. All of which is very interesting for the history of Egyptology, um, but most of which has been destroyed by the Egyptian government in the last 10 to 15 years as they've tended to move people out of these archaeological zones uh, and then try to sterilize them and kind of even disnify them to the greatest extent possible. There are some, you know, ethnographic projects to talk to people who, who either still live or used to live in these areas, and uh, there's there's. I can't, no, I can't remember the name of the project, but there's one specifically in Western Thebes. Maybe it's even oh, just no, called sorry. the Western Thebes Project. Sure. I don't know. I mean, do you know, Julia, what I'm talking about? I and am. What, they, what, they call, what they call this, this effort? Um, but stuff like that is, is, I think, is extremely valuable. And, you know, when you're talking about the history of a site, um, the, the, you know, the, the early modern history and the modern history of it, I think, is well worth, well worth preserving. And... Yeah, just doing that in terms of sort of traditional ethnographic research, preserving it digitally and making it available with the, the modern publications. I mean, one of the serious problems with archaeological publication, and it's not just Egyptological publication, is that they tend to show monuments with, with no people in them, totally divorced from you know, any actual uh, use or any actual connection with human beings. But yet these things have always been closely linked to culture and there's yeah i think there's a there's a lot that that should be done while it's still possible to do for sure 
I think another thing to maybe also bounce off since you you do kind of have this interesting background in, in architectural history um, is that, you know, Julia actually did a photogrammetry project of, uh, of a temple. Um, yes, and, uh, and actually we, we have here in our audience, Dr. Bernard Frischer, who's, who's part of IU, um, and he has a project called Rome Reborn, where they actually go through and are recreating uh, and digitally restoring some of these buildings as to what they would look like in antiquity and how that context interplays with it, the history of the time. You know, and, and it, you know, in some cases, the evolving use over the monument's history, where, you know, it maybe started out just as like a, a staircase, and then it became like a method of execution, and then, and then went back to being just like a form of ruins or, you know, so. Yeah, this is, this is a really interesting point in the sense of, I, I, because obviously we're talking about preserving our past, right? And where do we where do we draw the cutoff line of what what is the past or the ancient past? I mean, I gave a a, a, a range, but obviously there are. Uh, I gave an example at the very end of the slide where very recently in 2014, 2015, a Roman site in Syria was bombed um, called Palmyra, and there was a global initiative to try and restore the site as it used to be, at least through digital digital approaches. But this really begs the question of, you know, when we're thinking about cultural heritage, what about those who are actually living and embodying those spaces on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think this really touches up on the last point, which is when we're applying technology on the past, what can that, what can those application, how can those inversely, how can those applications inform us about what we're missing in terms of our um, sort of initiatives with, with the present? And the present obviously very susceptible and fragile, uh, susceptible to terrorist attacks, susceptible also to de decay, um, to phenomenological catastrophes um, that, I think are really important, important questions to bear in mind now that we're saturated with documentation um, and the publishing of that documentation, um, ver I mean, at least online, for instance. Um, and I am really curious to hear what some people have to say about sort of when do we draw the line of what is important and what isn't important when it comes to cultural heritage, for instance, um, because I think there, there has to be some triage and there always is triage because you do have time constraints, money, whatever political system you're working in, the people that you're living, that, that are occupying that space, the inevitable decay um, or damage of a, a particular monument. Um, but these are all factors that I think we as non-historians and historians have to keep in mind. Um, again, curious to hear what you guys have to say about this in the few minutes that we have left. Um, or if there are any other questions too. Yeah. Open floor. Yeah, we, we gave you a bit of a range. I see the chat um, and I'm not sure if there were some questions earlier on um, that were cut off by my premature um, <laughs> internet fallout but we gave you a bit of a range. Obviously there are methodologies that we did not talk about, but if you have any questions about photogrammetry, RTI, computational linguistics, vertopsies, or any lab techniques, um, we, are, we are here to help you. I'm actually gonna run to my next session, but thank you so much y'all oh, for no, talking. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'll see if I can find you in the community part and maybe we'll chat back and forth about different Appreciate things. Appreciate it. So. Yeah, All right. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Julie, I have a question. I yes. noticed that the uh, Harvard um, Museum, whose name I'm not, uh, I think has changed, has changed yeah. recently. Uh, has virtualized itself very nicely, but using Matterport, uh, which is a, a solution I personally have avoided 
uh, for various reasons. And I'm just wondering if you happen to know the motivation behind the choice of Matterport and yeah. how that's working out if people are happy that they chose to go that route. So the digitization of now recently called Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East, it used to be called the Semitic Museum, um, came about as um, in March of last year when um, the university had to shut down. And um, I was co-teaching a gen ed course that um, was looking to, that originally had a tour through the museum. And so what we, what we wanted to do was to create a very quick, um, but also for how quick it was, a high quality model um, so that students can tour the museum really quickly without having to um, scan the museum. It's, it, it took about two hours to do. Um, I know the friend who did it um, and it was very easy to annotate afterwards in Sketchfab. Um, and this was done um, in a period where we couldn't be on campus longer than a few hours. Um, otherwise, um, we would have to get tested every day. So this is this is something that I think again is a, an immediate uh, um, sort of reaction to um, to the pandemic. Um, that that's that speed and quality, unfortunately, are 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 clear factors in, in, in the choice between Matterport versus other more uh, traditional scanning methodologies. Um, but I think it's, it, it's effective and it's actually a methodology that I might use to quickly scan um, the cemetery in my, in my, in my dissertation. Um, but obviously it's not one that I would use for you know, a document, like a, a precise documentation of, of a site. Um, but I, um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, is there any thought, con calma, you know, after COVID to maybe going back and redoing it an, another way or are, are they going to, are the people in charge gonna stick with the Matterport's solution going forward? I think they're going to stick with the Matterport, but as with the objects contained within the museum, we are um, using light-based scanners and photogrammetric scanners to um, photo photogrammetric methodologies to make those high quality models. So you can get the feeling of being in the space as it would be in sort of a Google Maps kind of uh, way. And once you decide to select an object, it'll I think this is actually has is is embedded in in the museum tour. There are many objects that have been scanned that are of a high higher quality. Um, so again, I don't think I don't think the museum is going to to, to scan it um, perfectly as you would do. Um, I think it's a good solution for now. Yeah, and I think the the university has actually scanned the entirety of the campus and all of its uh, classrooms as well. In case uh, the pandemic resurfaces again, we could still have virtual classrooms. I think this was the initiative or the initial thought. Um, so students could still be in class, um, still be in sort of Seaver Hall without needing to, to be on campus. Um, I'm, I'm curious if um, IU has done something similar we, we haven't actually, but I, but since you, I've been wondering, and I, I emailed Bernie about this and he didn't reply, but um, we, we would like to, we would like to do some kind of a model of just the Hamilton Luger school, just really for promotional purposes, you know, so pr prospective students could do a, a kind of a tour of the building. So it doesn't have to be super high quality. And it sounds like maybe Matterport would, would work. I mean, what did you have? Just like a GoPro 360 camera that you walked through the building with or what, no, what? it's a there's a, a Matterport. Um, there's like a Matterport scanner. It's quite portable. Uh -huh. um, it can be on a tripod, or you can even put it on your backpack. Mm. And at various points, it'll just take a 360 photogrammetric scan. Mm -hmm. um, takes about 360 photos, stitches it all together. Um, what would 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 be done in a matter of you know half hour in one one section? You could do it in just a click. But the offside is that the quality isn't as great. Um, and there are obviously, there are clear gaps sometimes in, in the data as well. So let's say for instance, if you're scanning a tomb, um, one of these sort of Theban tombs, um, I, you may have seen the tomb of Mena as an example, 
but there are some points in, and I think um, Luke Hollis, who was in charge of that scanning for RC, was able to, to, to rectify this issue. But because you take a 360 and you have the scanner behind you or in front of you, what happens is you do get gaps of data. So where the starry ceiling is, is totally, ab like a patch is, is absent and not stitched together. Um, but again, that's something that can be easily resolved with, with photogrammetric methods where you just go in and you add the photo and, and that's, uh, so. That's it. That's mm -hmm. it, yeah. yeah. Um, for some of you who are, haven't spoken or, but are still here, any questions for us before we break? Brandon. Any general questions? Any life questions? <laughs> we'll talk about anything. Oh, yeah. So, Justine, I've known you for nine years, and I never realized how to pronounce your uh, last name. I've been, I've been saying uh, uh, Galambus all these years, but now I realize it's Columbus. So it, I did learn something. Columbus. It's Columbus like Columbus. Oh, Col Columbus. OK, all right. Yeah, but I, my mother says it one way, and my father says it Columbus. Like, I think my mother says Galambus. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't take it personally either way. Okay, well, Columbus, Columbus, potato, potato. Exactly. That's really what it is. Yep. <laughs> May I ask Justine a question if we have any time left? I, I, I love the new direction your uh, research is going now that you're in medical school. And I wonder if that's reflective of a shift of interest in medical school? Or are you sticking with the original goal? Uh, no, just a shift of competency. <laughs> so that, that's more what that's born out of, just a, a shift in competency. So uh, I will actually, as, um, as Dr. Vincent knows, I'll actually be giving a talk on medical papyri, specifically this little blurb in the Ebers papyrus at RC um, on kind of just like my my interpretation of of what this is and then what the case that they're describing is and then just kind of general challenges in medical papyri but um uh no i would i mean i think uh, it's interesting i i actually have someone dr summer decker here at university of of south florida and she is a um an anthropologist by trade, but uh, has her, her PhD in, in radiation and radiology studies. And so um, she works largely clinically, but I mean, her, her goal was the, uh, were the mummies and, and her like heart is with the mummies out in New Mexico. And so um, she, she's really, really active and, and, radiology and vertopsies on mummified remains but unfortunately in florida we just don't get a lot of them so i mean tampa's got like a podunk little art museum that has like a sarcophagus lid and that's it so um i mean i would love to scan a mummy but i i would have to i would have to find one first have you have you run into the uh, digital archaeologists at University of South Florida, in particular Laura Harrison, who's no. now become the associate editor of studies in digital heritage, and it's quite good. What? No, no, yeah. I, I, yeah, check. You know, I I could introduce you by email if okay. you want. To. Okay, send send me an email with her her information. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to meet her. I was yeah, just well, introduced to Dr. Heather um, Greer. Gil for, for Gil Frere King, who's like a big mummy person. I don't know, Dr. Vincent, if you've ever heard of her, but no, I, I would be absolutely be interested in hearing more from someone who's a little more local. <laughs>